Did you know that the Great Pyramid of Giza is the last of the seven wonders that still stands? Built over 4,000 years ago under the orders of the Egyptian king Khufu, it attracts tourists from all around the world and contains mysteries that scholars are still trying to solve. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, three historians discuss how the Great Pyramid was built and some of its 4,000-year-old secrets. We begin by taking a look at the Great Pyramid's size and the incredible feat of its construction. Enjoy. The Great Pyramid was built on the Giza Plateau near modern Cairo, Egypt. The mysterious Sphinx sits nearby, staring towards the east. Two other very large pyramids were nearby, plus seven small pyramids next to the big one. All around the pyramids are cemeteries, tombs, and mortuary temples. The purpose of the pyramids were as tombs for the pharaohs. We know this from the remains at the site, as well as from the various texts written in hieroglyphs. These writings included the pyramid texts and the Book of the Dead. These show a rich set of religious rituals and instructions for how the pharaoh could journey through the dangers of the underworld and reach the afterlife. The placement of tombs and pyramids on the west side of the Nile River was due to the symbolism associating the underworld with the setting sun in the west. The pyramid is made up of over 2 million blocks of limestone and granite, with the largest block weighing near 80 tons. Wow! The stone blocks were all quarried nearby, transported across the Nile by barge, and, and, and offloaded for moving along a causeway from the edge of the Nile to the pyramid. Estimates are that 20,000 workers labored for 20 years. Construction started around the year 2554 BC, although uncertainties in the old Egyptian chronology are a century or more. The Great Pyramid is connected with the pharaoh Khufu, who's also known by the Greek version of his name as Cheops. The pharaohs associated with the smaller pyramids at Giza are Khafre and Menkauri, and they're all successive rulers of the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom. Although we know very little about Khufu, we know he was born at the end of the 26th century BCE and lived more than 26 years. He was the son of King Snefru, the greatest pyramid builder of all time. The only named portrait of Khufu is a small ivory statuette just three inches high. The irony is striking. Khufu is often portrayed negatively in ancient texts. The Westcar Papyrus, a collection of stories written in the late Middle Kingdom, describes Khufu as heartless and inquisitive. In the Papyrus, Khufu's sons speak in turn telling tales for their father's amusement. The fourth story tells of a magician named Dedi, who has the power to reattach an animal's severed head to its body, among other things. Dedi performs his magic successfully before the king. Khufu then decides to test the magician and brings a condemned prisoner to be decapitated. Dedi is outraged. It is against the god's will. The 5th century BCE Greek historian Herodotus wrote that Cheops, the Greek name for Khufu, was a tyrant who enslaved his people. And the 1st century CE Jewish historian Josephus claimed the Hebrews built the pyramids. Yet, the largest pyramids were constructed over a thousand years before the Hebrews arrived in Egypt. Still, this idea persists in popular imagination. Despite Khufu's bad press, the ancient Egyptians revered him. The Egyptians celebrated King Khufu's cult nearly 2,000 years after his death. Some Egyptologists suggest Khufu saw himself as the incarnation of the sun god, Ra. Khufu's son, King Jedef Ray, called himself the son of Ra. The Great Pyramid is awesome in many ways. Part of this is a spectacular feat of engineering. Part of this is that the square base of the pyramid has its edges accurately aligned north-south and east-west. That is, the alignment is cardinal. The awesome part of this 
is that the alignment is accurate to one twentieth of a degree, an angle equal to one tenth of the apparent size of the moon in the sky. That's just a deviation of eight inches, or 20 centimeters, over the entire 230 meter baseline on the side. This is astounding accuracy to achieve in surveying the lines, <laughs> to say nothing the achievement of building along those lines in stone. Such a true north-south alignment can only be made with astronomy. Archaeological remains and hieroglyphic texts can give us some clues as to the alignment method. Texts and inscriptions from before and after the fourth dynasty describe a ceremony called stretching of the cord, with the pharaoh personally helping to determine the layout for the corners of the temples. Some of the texts tell of the pharaoh gazing at stars to the north, while others of the texts tell about the use of shadows. Well, Two types of artifacts have been identified as being included with the alignment ceremony. They're both sticks with markings and indentations. They're called merket and bay. We've no idea how they were used, although various proposals have been made. With all this, there's no agreement as to the alignment method, and many ideas are still outstanding. The ceremony does tell us more in that the ancient Egyptians had astronomical observations central to their beliefs, and these beliefs concerned the pharaoh himself. What is the function of the two mysterious air shafts in the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid? On two opposite walls of the king's chamber, at a gentle angle to two rectangular shafts approximately nine by eight inches, begin their journey through the body of the pyramid continuing all the way to the exterior. These shafts have been known for centuries, but their purpose has not. It's been speculated that they were constructed to provide air to the workers as they labored deep inside the pyramid. This is nonsense. Such small shafts with no way to circulate air could not possibly have done any good. The clue to their purpose may be a second set of similar air shafts inside the queen's chamber. The queen's chamber is not really the queen's chamber. The king's chamber, right in the middle of the pyramid, was intended for Khufu's final resting place. But what if the king died before the pyramid was completed? What if the pyramid hadn't reached that height yet? The queen's chamber was Khufu's plan B. Much closer to ground level, it could have been used if the pharaoh died near the beginning of the pyramid's construction. It's in this room that two more air shafts were discovered in 1872 by Wayman Dixon, a young engineer sent to Egypt to build a bridge across the Nile near Giza. Dixon discovered the shafts, but never figured out their purpose or why they went there. He set fires inside the shaft to see if smoke exited on the outside of the pyramid. It didn't. And to this day, we don't know where the shafts in the Queen's Chamber end. I think the purpose of the air shafts was to give Khufu's Ba access to the world of the living. That's why when the queen's chamber was being built, they put in the shafts. There was even a little symbolic door. But Khufu's Ba never used these shafts. Remember, the queen's chamber was only plan B. Later, when the pyramid had reached the height of Khufu's burial chamber, Khufu was alive and well, so he wasn't going to be buried in the queen's chamber. They had to put in a second set of shafts for the king's chamber so they would be close to where the mummy was going to be placed. So false doors were really a big deal. The casing stones at the base of the Great Pyramid of Khufu display one of the most remarkable feats of stone carving in the world. Khufu's stonemasons fitted together seven to 15 ton blocks of stone with joints so fine that not even a razor blade can slip between them. How did the Egyptians achieve this amazing feat? When the builders began the pyramid's foundation pavement and the bottom course of the casing, they set the cornerstones and several center stones on each face to establish the line. In the quarry, stone cutters dressed only the bottom of the stone to fit precisely with the rock below it. The stone was then hauled to its intended place on the pyramid. Once placed, the side joint faces of the stone were dressed so they fit the neighboring stone. 
The slope was marked on the joint face and moved to lie flush with its neighbor's stone. Now the upper face was labeled. Part of the stone was still overhanging the stone course beneath. Where the two neighboring stones touched each other, extra stock on the front of the block was beveled away from the slope line. The unfinished stock was left like this to help anchor the stone delivery ramps that rose with the pyramid. Once the pyramidion was placed, the masons dressed the extra stock on the front of the block, working from the top of the pyramid down as they removed the delivery ramps. They chipped away the excess stone on the pyramid face so that the spaces between each block would gradually close. When the join was so small a knife blade could not slip between the joins, the masons knew they could not cut any deeper into the stone. They had reached the desired plane of the pyramid face. The Great Pyramid has attracted vast amounts of attention from fringe thinkers. There's even a word for it. Pyramidology. <laughs> Early examples are claims that the dimensions of the Great Pyramid encode the number of days in a year, the mathematical constant pi, the golden ratio, and the date of the start of World War I. For a recent example, one internet site finds deep significance in the fact that the Great Pyramid, Easter Island, and Stonehenge form a triangle on the Earth. <laughs> well, of course, three points form a triangle. Another favorite claim of pyramidologists is called pyramid power. This idea flourished back in the early 1970s with extensive press coverage. Its claim is that the basic pyramid shape channels unknown powers. So pyramid shaped containers were said to preserve food, to, to sharpen razor blades, and to trigger sexual urges. Back as a young kid, I spent a lot of time making pyramid models putting food and razor blades into them, and testing them against other identical stuff placed into cubic containers. This sort of procedure is called a control experiment, where two tests are made with only one difference between the two cases, so that any difference in the outcome can be directly attributed to the one changed situation. In my experiments, the only difference was in the shape of the container. I found zero difference in the rotting of meat and the sharpness of the razors. So this means that the shape of the container is irrelevant. This is the core of the scientific method, where we let nature tell us about reality. Well, many other people have tried similar experiments, including the Mythbusters back in, in 2005. These have all been miserable failures for pyramid power. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.